We are so happy to have you all here today for our Advancing Sleep Research, our new core digital measures and resources for sleep. We've got a lot to talk about and a lot to celebrate today on our call. And we really hope that you enjoyed this session as a celebration of the work we have all done together, but also can take our resources and use them to further your work and to further the understanding of sleep. We're going to start with some housekeeping before we get right into our um, our discussions today. We are recording the session, but that's because the slides and the recording will be available afterwards on our webinar page. If you have a question for discussion during our Q&A, you can type it into the chat box and we'll keep monitoring that. Please don't transcribe this webinar. It is with real great honour I'd like to introduce um, Joe, uh, Joe from the National Sleep Foundation, Vice President of Research, to um, have some opening remarks for us and talk about um, the importance of sleep and sleep research for everyone. Joe, would you like to um, would you like to please um, come on camera and I'll start presenting the slides for you. Thank you, Pip. And before I begin, I'd just like to uh, note the gratitude and the delight that the National Sleep Foundation had to participate in this important project. As you said, my name is Joe Drzewski, and I'm the Vice President of Research and Scientific Affairs at National Sleep Foundation. Next slide. For those that don't know, National Sleep Foundation is an independent nonprofit organization dedicated to improving health and well-being through sleep education and advocacy efforts. In addition to this mission, we have four main or core goals as an organization. I highlighted the fourth, which is that sleep science and insights are rapidly incorporated into accessible health products and services. I highlighted this, obviously, as it's clearly relevant to the work being done by the Digital Medicine Society, but also uh, feeds directly into our promise to the public, which is to help anyone and everyone be their best step self. Next slide. So we take a step back and first start with the question of why sleep? It's clear that sleep is critical for all aspects of health and performance. We spend a third of our life sleeping, so it's not a surprise that sleep is so strongly connected to our brain health, mental health, heart health, obesity, diabetes, immune function, and essentially any other public health priority. I often say that I'd be hard pressed not or to find, a, find an area of functioning that sleep is not critically important for. In terms of sleep health and safety for wellness, self-care, medical conditions, these are clearly in line as a focus and priority for the public, for clinicians, for industry and policymakers alike. And it is important to include previous work guidelines, standards, as we attempt to advance the field and move forward so that we have consistency across use cases. Next slide. National Sleep Foundation has over a decade long history of publishing research guidelines and standards where we essentially translate science and data and insights into recommendations that the public can apply to promote healthy sleep behaviors. I highlighted two of the six previously published consensus guidelines as they're directly relevant to the work being done by Digital Medicine Society, that being sleep duration and sleep quality. In terms of sleep duration, anytime you hear that the typical adult needs seven to nine hours of sleep on a nightly basis, you are essentially referencing an NSF consensus guideline. Now you see that we publish these guidelines in academic peer reviewed journals, but then we translate them into actionable uh, information for the public. Next slide. In addition to those consensus guidelines, National Sleep Foundation also has an extensive history of publishing standards for consumers technology. You see at the earliest 2016 through to just earlier this month, National Sleep Foundation in conjunction with the Consumer Technology Association published a, uh, a, a standard for best practices around sleep quality determination and consumer sleep technology. I highlighted this because clearly it's important to the current work being done, Digital Medicine Society, but also it's a good, um, uh, use case of how previous uh, standard or previous consensus guideline can be applied to a standard. Next slide. With that, I would just like to highlight the consistent sleep measures across use cases are critical. 
One, we know the standards and guidelines exist. Consistence, consistency in application is key so that we continue to innovate and have progress um, that can be applied to multiple different individuals, therapeutic areas, and whatnot. And I'd also like to highlight and just note that the Digital Medicine Society Core Measures of Sleep and all the work group partners demonstrated really a great example of how to apply previous work to these expanded use cases and to new novel therapeutic areas. So thank you. Thank you so much, Joe, for putting that background together. And it's been such a pleasure to work with the NSF and all of our partners, we're we'll talking a little bit about now, um, to build off the great science that has come before and really try and democratize uh, sleep to put it in the hands of the general public, of patients, of, uh, of researchers. And that's exactly what we've done. Just about 16 months ago, a big collection of us came together um, to really try and understand sleep research and how we can move from um, the environment in the lab where we have an, uh, a very artificial uh, setup, not naturalistic night's sleep, and can we start focusing research and measurement in the comfort of, of our own beds, where we sleep all the time, because this is where sleep happens. Um, and from all of these experts in the field, um, we have learned together, grown together, and been able to put together um, a really great set of core measures that, that, that cross the um, therapeutic area spectrum. We have our core measures. We worked together. We did literature reviews. Um, we did um, consensus panel work. We talked to uh, experts and patients alike to see what was it that, that matters to clinicians? What was it that matters to patients? And what should we measure? We ended up settling um, on our on call measures. You'll see how these look in a little bit, but total sleep time, the amount of time of sleep you get in a night, initial sleep onset latency. How long does it take someone to get to sleep? It's an important marker of of a lot of uh, a, a lot of um, sleep health. Wake after sleep onset, waking up in the night. I think we've all been there. And how long do you wake up in the night? How often do you wake in up in the night with number of wake events? The efficiency of your sleep as well, as long as total napping time or sleep during the time when you're not meant to be sleeping. We've also su supplemented this with emerging measures of health as well. So these measures, the, the, the plan for these is to, is to standardize and make research more transparent. This is a lot on a slide, but it's just an example of one of the many resources we have to help you measure sleep. We outlining in graphics what um, a, a core measure should look like, for example, total sleep time. And then we specify the different parameters that you may need to be able to not just collect sleep, but make sure you're telling people um, in a research setting, for example, this is how I measure total sleep time. Because when we start being consistent and transparent about uh, our measurement of sleep, we can uh, we all know what we're talking about. We can interpret results and we can compare results. We based all of these on conceptual models, like um, literature reviews from clinical side and from a patient side. And these conceptual models are available to, to you as a community to take from our website, um, download and use. But there are resources outside of this and resources for everyone. If you go to our website, you'll find resources on the main page, but then also sub pages for you to use as well for clinical researchers, clinicians and healthcare and decision makers and developers alike. Um, and anyone can use these resources. There's a springboard for, for all of our resources, including the core measures. For the researchers among you, we have checklists and report forms to help you make sure you're setting up um, setting up your um, uh, your studies and and your uh, your trials um, with the end in mind to make sure you're collecting that data you're going to need. Um, we have an FAQ document that has all the information to make a case for measuring sleep in the work that you do. We are really proud of of, of all of our work and. We we really came, tried to come together to make sure everyone could access it. And for the clinicians and for the general population, one of the resources we did with the National Sleep Foundation was to take their guidance and try and put it out so that people and clinicians can monitor their own sleep and have metrics to say, 
hang, how is my sleep doing? Like, am I getting enough sleep? Am I getting to sleep in a good amount of time? And that interpretation guides there. But also when talking about that with clinicians, we've come up with a reimbursement guide. So clinicians can use this as part of their practice to monitor sleep and attach it to, um, attach it to health conditions and get reimbursed for it as well. For people who work with vendors and vendors themselves, um, we've come up with resources to make sure you're, we're facilitating your discussions. You're asking the right questions and you're ready to answer the questions you're going to be asked all about the devices and technologies that measure sleep so that you're getting the right equipment, the right technology at the right time. And I'm really pleased to say that I think we've all needed to use graphics in our work to try and make a point. And all of the graphics we've made as part of this project, and this is an example of just some of them, are available for download on our website. And you can just take these and use them in your work, freely available. And I think they're going to help make sure everyone is on the same page when talking about sleep and the work that we do. With that, um, I would like to thank um, Again, all of our wonderful, wonderful project team for coming together and giving us the expertise to be able to, to, to move forward with a project like this and launch a project like this into the world. We really hope that you use these resources and that was just a flavor. Explore the website, download the resources, see how they can be used in your work. And now we're gonna start a series of chats. We have a lot of them and we're gonna start with our resources in action panel. Um, we've got um, a fair few um, people as part of this panel. We have Nina from Boston University, Eric from Jazz Pharmaceuticals. We have Katerina from Takeda, Jay from Beacon Biosignals and Raul from Takeda. And we're going to uh, have cameras on now, stop sharing the screen. And we're going to um, uh, start our resources in action chat where we can see how people are using these measures. So thank you team. And thanks for, um, for for joining me. And I'd like to start with asking quite a broad question. One of the big wins from this work is that the cause measures that we've come out with give us like a shared language to communicate between ourselves. We can know, now if we're talking about total sleep time, we can have uh, resources to say, look, this is what I'm I'm talking about with total sleep time. Like how do we how do we me how do we work together to make sure we measure it um, measure it well. We've backed this up with technical documentation so we can be precise and clear and transparent in what we're talking about. And sometimes we have to deviate from that and that's fine, but deviation made from the language and the core measures, we can, we, we can really be clear about. So thinking about these core measures themselves, um, how will this uh, impact your work? And I'm gonna start by going to, to Nina, please. Uh, thank you, Pip. Um, as you mentioned, having this clear and really precise definitions is going to really provide a way for standardization. It's going to help us researchers to have some type of consistency within our work, but also have consistency between studies, which, of course, in turn, it's going to lead for reliable comparability between studies and um, what's been previously published. But I think that it's also going to make it a lot easier for us to collaborate and integrate data and results from multiple different studies, again, both um, within and between labs. Perhaps more, more importantly, or most importantly in my work, these core measures are going to be particularly valuable in our interactions with the different vendors that we work with to really streamline our discussion with respect to the metrics that they measure and how they report out their process data. And then lastly, as an educator, I think that the core measures can really be a fantastic tool to teach undergrads or grad students who are just getting into the field, and it'll provide them with appropriate um, foundation that's needed going forward. That was a really lovely take on the different ways these can be used uh, from your perspective. And I know that everyone's going to use things in different ways. We've got lots of resources going on here as well. Um, Kate um, Raul um, from Takeda, what, what's your take on this? And I'll let you decide who's going to, going to be speaking first and pass it on to each other. Sure, I can start off. So I work in the digital health sciences group at Takeda and Raul and I closely collaborate as he's in our quantitative sciences group and helps to develop some novel endpoints for evaluating sleep within our clinical trials. And first, I think the core measures of sleep are really helpful, um, as Nina mentioned, for developing a common uh, 
language, a common ground to discuss sleep across different groups at levels that everyone can understand. So whether I'm coming at it from discussing with vendors or clinicians or Raul's coming at it from developing new ways to measure sleep within clinical trials, I think having a common language that can be used internally um, at one's company or externally with vendors, with researchers is incredibly helpful. Um, I think another aspect of this that Nina touched on, and I'll expand on a little bit, is communication with vendors. So in my role, I work a lot with discussing um, new technologies that we might include in future Takeda clinical trials. And one challenge has been um, everyone has a different way of talking about something, measuring something. And there's a really great checklist now that DIME has that makes those discussions with vendors really helpful from the side of the um, the uh, um uh, the bit pharma or biotech that are maybe outsourcing to a vendor and also to the vendors themselves to help develop novel technologies that could be used in trials. Um, but I want to give Raul a chance to talk about how some of this work is used for developing novel endpoints as well. Yep. Thanks, Katarina. Yeah. So uh, we work closely on more on the endpoint side. Uh, so to hit on that shared language point a little more, uh, at least from, from my perspective, I think it's super, super like I'm super grateful and it's very foundational to just be able to talk, uh, not only uh, I think between collaborators and ourselves, uh, but vendors as well uh, when it comes to certain sleep metrics. So just having that baseline understanding of total sleep time wasso and all the related metrics is good. But what I'm, I, I think personally excited about, uh, Pip, you showed it a little bit, the emerging digital measures. I think as uh, sleep is getting out of the clinic and these devices continue maturing, it's not going to be uh, just these uh, core sleep metrics that we look at in the lab, because in a naturalistic 24-hour setting uh, and with pathological populations, sleep can be unstable, uh, unstable, it can be polyphasic. And really, I think the emerging digital measures, at least for me, is, is personally exciting. Um, so we can look at sleep not just at night in one instance, but uh, for a variety of populations in at home, different settings across the 24 hours. So really, I think the 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 starting point, the foundation, and what Dime has done to set everyone on the uh, just level playing field is is really amazing, and I'm excited as uh, to how it's going to progress. So thank you. Me too. And before I call the uh, the next in, I want to weave in some of the questions we're getting from the chat because it really it really matches with uh, that point you just made there, um, which was about this moving out of the lab into the home. And people are saying, well, and, and these emerging measures, right? Um, we, we've said, here's a core measure, here's some emerging measures, here's ways to specify them for consistency. And one of the questions is, um, what about maximum allowable differences from what we've we've set out? Well, the point is we've set out a baseline, right, for everyone to get onto the same page. And if you differ from that baseline, that's not inherently a problem. It's about being transparent about what you're measuring. And that's and the same about um, another question that came in. It was about um, high night to night variability. And you mentioned this just just now, uh, Raul. It's um, it's kind of like what what how many nights of sleep do we need? Well, I can't answer that yet. Maybe some of you can bring it in, but the, the point is it's more than one night in a PSG lab. So we've got the opportunity to start looking at that. Um, so on that point, I'm going to bring Eric in uh, to give to give some of his views. Sure. Thank you very much. And I, I just I want to echo all the comments that have been made so far. Very important. Uh, the the shared language, the standardization across <clears throat> the measures is is very important. Uh, you can take napping, for example. Uh, there's flexibility in this measure. The core measure is based on intentional napping, but it can be modified, as shown in the ontology, to account for unintentional daytime napping. For us at Jazz, this is very important. Uh, one of the disorders that we're really focused on is idiopathic hypersomnia. It's a disorder in which napping uh, occurs during the daytime, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. Uh, it causes significant distress and concern for the individuals. Uh, we want to make sure that we're transparent in what we're measuring and can show a treatment effect with the therapeutics we've been creating in a clinical trial setting. 
And yeah, thanks for that. And that's one of the things working with you and the team, we were very conscious of making sure we can build into not just daytime napping, because it isn't just about a nap is it feels like a very conscious thing, right? But it's this idea of take the core measure and whether it's intentional or not, edit it, do what you need to do to make it work for you. And then tell people how you've done that. And that's something that I think working with you, we saw the importance of having a baseline, but also flexibility to build from. So these are measures for everyone, not just for, you know, one person. Um, I'd like to invite Jay to come in and give give your thoughts. Absolutely. Um, I, I don't know that I have a whole lot more to add because I think everyone on this panel has addressed the exact points that I was thinking. But um, at Beacon, we're, we're big believers in the importance of monitoring sleep across a variety of, of pathology, a variety of diseases, not just sleep disorders. I think that's true for everyone on this panel and, and everyone on this call as well, so that's, that's obvious. Um, but it's interesting because just before this call, I was on a, it was in a meeting with, um, with some of our collaborators, their sleep researchers, researchers, and then we had um, a patient advocate group present as well. And we were discussing what to monitor, and it was as simple as, um, it was as simple as sleep efficiency. And the researchers were debating how to define the denominator of sleep efficiency. Do we monitor all the sleep window? One group did want to do that. One just wanted to do from start of sleep to the end. And while they understood the debate they were having, the patient advocate did not. And it's important because in one method, you're, you're, you're including whether the child, the, the pediatric sleep disorder, whether the child is falling asleep when they should. In the other one, you're, you're more focused on awakenings. And that's really important for the patient but the key person in that meeting might not have understood what the researchers were debating. And I actually, I was wondering if I could steal some of the core measures before this call. I did not. I did not. I was thinking, oh, this is the moment. I mean, this is, this is, this is exactly what we need. So yeah. that shared language is so critical because we're, we're talking to a variety of people who may be absolute experts on one end and may actually be the people who are suffering who really need to understand what the experts are trying to measure because maybe the experts aren't measuring well. Um, and then, you know, for, for us, we, we ultimately, we're, we're, we're a developer of one method of, of, of sleep monitor. We're, we're a, we, we make a particular hardware that can monitor sleep. But, um, you know, ultimately, we don't want to just do that for research. We want this to be something that is helpful for patients. We want to improve health. And we're going to need to make sure that when we approach regulatory agencies and physicians, that everyone understands what we did and why. And this shared language is going to be really critical when we get to that. And yeah, we're going to talk a bit more about the resources in just a moment. I'll ask a question on that and we'll, we'll pull out ones that you think are going to be useful for you. Um, but I wanted to like yeah highlight that. What, what I really like there is this is a resources in action call. And you've already highlighted, hey, look, I've got use cases where, where this is going to help change the way I do stuff. And actually, they've been live today. So maybe you could have taken them. But for next time, everyone on the call, please take our resources, please use them, make make your life easier. And let's start doing sleep. Anyway, on that point, um, you've already alluded to some of the whole, whole host of resources that we've got available. And I, I showed very quickly a whistle stop tour through them as well. Um, and this is all to help you not just identify the core measures, but also implement them in your work. So out of these core measures, um, uh, out of these core measures, sorry, resources that we've produced, which ones do you think are going to be particularly useful to yours? So, uh, Eric, I'm going to take this to you first. Yeah, from our standpoint, the the evidence checklists and the reporting forms will give us a great head start in making sure our studies are planned out from square one. Yeah, thanks for that. And that's like exactly the use there as well. Like I've I think it's all well and good talking about transparency and consistency, but unless you give people the tools to be transparent and consistent, you're asking them to plan from square square one and everyone could be planning in a in a very different way. And the best thing I like about these checklists is um uh, one of the project team members came to me and said, um, Oh, like it'd be great if it could be set up so that these can just be appended to a manuscript as a supplementary information to show you're working or can be included in the appendix of a briefing book for regulatory uses. And that's exactly how we've tried to set it up. Uh, a, a real way to yeah, just just show you're working. Um, Nina, I'm going to move on, on to you. I think you were mentioning um, the Library of Digital Products and, and other things as well. 
Yeah, so the library of digital measurement products for sleep, I think for us, it's going to be really crucial. It'll help us really speed up um, how we assess the different technologies that are available. And then what I'm really excited about is having a collection of different types of technologies and their form factor. So if it's a watch, a phone, adhesive, whatever, um, alongside having information about which of these have gone through which of the V3 evidence framework. So verification, analytical and clinical validation, usability validation, that's going to be really helpful for us to identify vendors and technologies that we can then include in our studies that would meet our needs for any given study that we're working on. Thanks. And yeah, the, the library link, I think it's just gone live in the chat. It's not, the library has been there for a while, but this, we've taken all of our sleep research and we've added it to everything else. So it's a very comprehensive library. And that, that's exactly it. It's, it's a collection of products you can take now and the core measures are represented in them in some in some way, and you can you can use our core measures framework to see where the deviations are. But you've got that evidence to hand to really like speed up what you're doing, and I really think that's going to be a very useful tool. Um, Kate, Raoul, um, would you like to pitch in with the resources you think are going to change what you might be doing? Sure, I can start off. Um, I think first, as we talked about a little bit previously, um, the vendor checklist is going to be extremely useful. We actually have one internally that we use that's not sleep specific. So having a sleep specific one that um, not only um, us at Takeda can use, but also other sponsors can use when they're evaluating vendors would be extremely useful. And then another thing I'd like to mention is just when we think about implementing digital technologies within a clinical trial, having that uh, common language to talk about with our um, CROs, with DCT providers, with patients, with the clinicians who are running those trials, that'll also be extremely useful. And uh, I'll pass off to Raul. Yeah, uh, so yeah, I think my points are similar probably to, to Nina's working on the endpoint side of it. Really like the interplay between the shared language and then the V3 framework to try and help uh, some of these more innovative endpoint technologies, uh, one, be, be shared among different collaborators, but to become more mature and, and work them uh, work their way into sort of more secondary or um, uh, not just exploratory uh, settings in a, in a trial, I think would be yeah, super critical for us. And I think like going back to the um, to the library, it's living as well, right? So those people are out there being like, wait, I've got a technology. I want to be, I want that represented in the library. That can be submitted to us and it can be added. And we're going to be doing rolling updates from the literature as well uh, to make sure that stays current and is always a useful research. Jay, would you like to pitch in? Yeah, so the, the measure that I was referring to came from the um, sleep measurement system. So that's probably the, the, the core measure that, that we would use most. I actually look forward to the, the checklist. I think that's going to simplify our discussion with our clients because then they'll they'll already have some ideas of what they want to measure uh, and what we should be measuring, or maybe you know which devices are the best for them. Um, but for us, there's one other. I, I can't recall exactly what it was called. It's the uh, clinical reimbursement pathway. I think it was. Yeah, reimbursement for clinicians. Um, so as as a device company, you know, goal as I mentioned is one day we want to be helping patients directly, and so understanding the reimbursement pathways would be very helpful to us at some point in the future. We have filled up our time. We do have a question in the chat. I'm just going to quickly answer it. I want very quick high level thoughts on it. It's a bit of a different take, but we are going to be moving sleep into the real world and there are social factors and stressors doing our research that can just impact sleep. What are your thoughts? Anyone uh, like to just come off mute and say, what are your thoughts in dealing with this as part of your work? I have a strong opinion, so I'll start off. I'll say that uh, that is absolutely correct. Sleep is not a one time measure it once and you're done thing, right? You're, everyone knows your sleep is this variable from night to night, even within a night. So the, the key to me is that you really have to monitor sleep over a longitudinal basis. I don't know. Don't ask me what the minimum time is. I don't know. But the idea of doing one night in the lab is it's ridiculous, right? And especially not even in your home setting. So that's why digital measures of sleep are so critical in my mind. Thank you all. We're going to have to stop there, I'm afraid. We have to move on to our next one. This has been a wonderful discussion. Um, and I hope I'm now sharing... Oh, Zoom screen share. I'm now sharing my screen.
and I will progress the slides once I have them up on my side. Right. <laughs> We're now going to move on to a fireside chat talking about the importance of sleep staging. This is uh, with Michael um from Bayer. Um, are you there? I'm here. Oh, great. Um, right, I will um, stop the screen share so we can we can see each other well. Um, now, we talked a little bit about the library of uh, digital endpoints and uh, uh, digital um, measurement products, uh, how it's been updated for sleep. And there's lots of good information on there, lots of V3 looking at the core measures. But the basis of all of this is, is sleep staging. And sleep staging it's it's foundational we can't build anything else uh, unless unless we understand this and i think there's um a couple of things uh, to talk about in this regard and it's um maybe you can talk a little bit about sleep staging but also um you can um think about um uh, how we are democratizing the process of sleep research as well so thank you simply uh i think uh, a lot of what we're doing in uh, pharmaceutical industry in particular in, in healthcare in, uh, in general is related to translation or translating the uh, physiology. I mean, we'll, our observations back into the physiology and back to understanding of the disease and behaviors of the patients and, and so on, et cetera. And uh, uh, we are, with this project in particular, we are, uh, I think, and hope launching a new phase in uh, translating uh, uh, sleep measures into uh, what we want to see as outcomes. And uh, that it, it, it takes a lot. It's, it's a very complex process because the mapping uh, itself is uh, not only nonlinear, but it's, it's, it depends on, on many parameters and it will also depend on the particular population and particular disease. Uh, uh, Accidentally, I, I think what happened in the uh, sleep research, uh, polysomnography uh, came as a standard uh, reference or reference standard of how we uh, relate uh, these parameters to, to the state that's of the patient. The lab based, uh, uh, not right. naturally. Yeah. Right, that's the lab, lab so, so called sleep lab. And, and now what we need to really to do is uh, to bring it to uh, real life settings because as, as already was mentioned many times in our uh, chat today, uh, real life settings is where uh, the uh, patient is happening and the disease is happening. So uh, the uh, foundation, uh, so we, because of the polysomnographic lab, sleep lab, we uh, uh, have a certain understanding of the structure of uh, sleep staging and, and sleep goes through stages uh, uh, through the night. And uh, the stages of changing sleep states uh, relate to uh, human physiology and pretty much everything that the body is doing to recover and prepare for the uh, next uh, day and next activity. Uh, so all um, this is translated into measurements that we can take with different technologies. And uh, these measurements need to be put on a very solid ground of understanding how they relate to the sleep, uh, sleep staging. So uh, in spite of the fact that we're coming up with the very simplistic uh, uh, measures, uh, uh, numbers, uh, behind this is a pretty complex human physiology that needs to be unfolded. I so that that's what we are going to be doing from now on and continue to be doing. And I think that like looking at other measurement areas like you know, ECG, for example, I think you said before, like looking how far we've come from how complex that used to be to now how it can be done outside the lab. And that's maybe what we're we're seeing with sleep and with our core measure set as well. Yeah, the, the, this is a great example. When uh, 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 twenty years ago, uh, the gold gold standard was twelve uh, lead ECG. It still is standard, of course, for ECG assessment. But uh, the regulators twenty years ago were not open to accepting one, two, three lead ECGs as uh, diagnostic measures, and now they are. So uh, during these 20 years, the uh, democratization process uh, took place. And uh, now we have all this wonderful wearable devices which allow us to diagnose uh, conditions, uh, uh, heart conditions. I I'm expecting a very similar uh, thing to happening to sleep. We are going to see increasing number 
uh, of uh, technologies uh, which allow real life assessment and then uh, translating this into uh, measures that can be used as clinical outcomes. So that's that, that is a great trend. Yeah, and, I, and, and that's what I'm really hoping for, the democratization, transparency, and consistency. But Michael, we're going to have to jump into our next one. Thank you so much for your thoughts on sleep staging and its importance. I'm going to resume my share, hopefully. Okay, I don't know if it's uh, resuming. Let's see. Yeah, great. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> We now have another panel, the possibilities for and the importance of the out-of-lab out assessment of sleep. Uh, Sarah, uh, one of our Digital Medicine uh, Society colleagues, is going to be moderating this with Mark Aloya and Badana Radic, uh, Ratic um, from Bayer as well, uh, Mark Aloya from Sleep Number. So without further ado, I would like to invite um, uh, the team to bring on their cameras. And I'm going to let you, Sarah, handle this conversation. Thank you. I look forward to it. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I think we've been actually perfectly set up by the resources and action panel and the comments with Michael. We get to talk about something I think we're all really excited and passionate about, which is taking sleep measurement out of the lab and into the natural setting. Um, the implications are huge and, and we have a lot of good things to talk about. And I want to start maybe by um, with a question for you, Mark, and just to set it up. We, we've heard it today. We hear it all the time. I've lost count of how many times I've read it in the literature polysomnography, PSG, is the gold standard for measuring sleep. And as your colleagues, uh, Shannon Sullivan and Joe Drzezki recently reminded me, PSG is important and it is the reference standard for certain conditions, but it is not universally the standard. And, and for certain things like circadian rhythm disorders, um, insomnia, and some other things, we don't start with PSG. That's not the best way to get a sense of what's going on here. So while PSG is important, and I, and I think Jay actually just mentioned this too, sleep assessment is so much more than, than one night of study in a sleep lab. Mark, can you talk a little bit about what gets you excited about sleep in the natural setting, the opportunities that are here, and, and also maybe some challenges that we might run into as we kind of go out of the lab? Sure. Thank you, Sarah. And first, um, on behalf of myself and Sleep Number, I want to thank you for inviting me uh, to this session. So, look, I want to give some perspective. Sleep is a relatively new field in medicine, right? We have uh, our, the people who discovered REM sleep are only now passing away, right? So it's a relatively new field. And we have to take that perspective and, un and understand that sleep was built on the back of polysomnography. But it doesn't mean that polysomnography provides us everything, right? So what we've learned over the past several decades is several things that tell us that sleep needs some support from other measures. So a couple of those things are we know that about 80% of people with obstructive sleep apnea remain undiagnosed. They're just not making it to PSG. And PSG is still the standard for obstructive sleep apnea. But we need to think about, as we create awareness in sleep, how we help people who are out there wondering, do I have a sleep disorder? How do we help them raise awareness around the need for, for greater sleep assessment? And we can do that with wearable devices, that's be that watches, rings, whatever, or nearable devices. Our company makes smart beds that monitor sleep and, and biosignals like heart rate and respiratory rate. And we can create awareness with, those, with that aspect. And, and that's important to think about when we think about population sleep health. Another thing we've learned over the past several decades is simply that PSG falls short, like you said, on certain things. And we've heard it many times today. When you think about things like even sleep duration, which is critical. I mean, the number one sleep disorder is really just volitionally not getting enough sleep, just not prioritizing your sleep. And if we get one or even two nights at home with something connected to us, we can't assume that we understand what sleep duration is in that person because of the inter-night variability and all the different social factors that have already been raised. And in addition to that, like Eric brought up, napping is sleep. And we don't catch that with PSG ever. So we can catch that with wearable and nearable devices. And that's really critical. And the other thing I'd say that really excites me is this emerging metric that I think Raul spoke about, one of them, um, is sleep regularity index. So this is now a relatively, I wouldn't say relatively new metric, but we're getting more and more data that shows that sleep regularity, how regular you are with your bedtimes and your wake times, is an important indicator of sleep health. We at Sleep Number just published a paper where we looked at one year's sleep in 330,000 individuals. We followed them for a full year and looked at their sleep. And we find that people who are relatively early birds and regular 
have lower heart rate and respiratory rate, better cardiorespiratory function than, uh, than others. And I think that link is going to go into the chat so people can access that. But, but you can't do that with polysomnography. And you open yourself up to really understanding population sleep health with that kind of technology. Okay, you you packed a lot in there. The accessibil accessibility, reaching people who aren't in the sleep lab, um, getting getting the picture of what somebody's actual sleep environment is like and how that's affecting them individually, and then the scale. How, how many how many people were under study in your recent publication? Three hundred thousand. Three hundred thirty thousand. We published. Yeah. Yeah, just enormous potential here. Um, I love that. There's a lot we could go in here and, and we don't have time. Can I just ask quickly, is there a specific resource um, that we've produced as a group over the last several months that you really see as, um, that can help as we're kind of moving out of the lab and looking at systematizing and, and getting this to the masses? What's kind of something maybe that's your favorite or that can help address the challenges we might run into? Well, I think one of my favorites is one of, is the emerging uh, measures, right? And sleep regularity is a critical one that we're seeing not just in our study, but several other studies in the literature. But I think the other thing that really helps us with is this common language, being able to discuss sleep in, in, a, in a consistent way across companies and across and with researchers and just bringing everyone up to the same page, I think is critical and a, and a true understanding that sleep is longitudinal, as, as many people have said today. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. Um, open science at its best and also agree about sleep regularity. This is really where digital health shines and it's it's really worth the bit of it, the, all the attention we can give to it. So thank you, Mark. Um, but Donna, I wanted to give you a chance to speak for a minute. You know, as part of this work, we we added sleep to the digital measurement product library, as has been referenced. And one thing that struck me as I was working on that is of the maybe 155 or so publications that we ended up including that we went and looked at how is sleep being measured out there. And, and in what context? About 25, a little under 25% of those contexts were sleep disorder specific, but the rest, 75%, was across a huge range of therapeutic areas, the general population, et cetera. Um, and it really just underscores the opportunity to, to look at sleep in a variety of settings. And I know you have some experience in looking at the importance of looking at sleep when that's not necessarily our primary focus. Can you just give some thoughts on what's exciting to you about that and, and, and share some of your perspective? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Sarah. I think uh, one of the important aspects of this project was that we indeed took a couple of uh, different therapeutic areas and we uh, asked patients on the one hand and researchers on the other hand uh, why sleep is important for those therapeutic areas that are not from the uh, narrow um, sleep uh, domain. Uh, and we are starting to understand how different disease uh, symptoms uh, are related to sleep and then are related to daytime functioning. And so all of this probably forms a very complex causal network of different factors and variables. And probably these causal relationships uh, go in different ways that we're just starting to understand. And so now being able to advance uh, the possibility to measure all these factors on a granular level simultaneously and not really uh, on an episodic, very discrete uh, occasional levels, but uh, longitudinally, uh, continuously, uh, uh, this presents a lot of opportunities for us to start really understanding these complex causal relationships and to see how diseases impact sleep and vice versa and uh, what kind of impact we can make with treatment of uh, some other disease uh, symptoms on such an important uh, aspect of health and quality of life. Uh, and so uh, the ability to do this now in the naturalistic uh, setting in, in home uh, and also to do this on these multiple nights setting and so on also uh, makes me as a statistician very excited because I know that with this we can really capture a lot of the uh, just uh, physiological and lifestyle variability that goes into this. And so uh, having this rich and granular data, uh, we will now be able to uh, build more robust measures of sleep, robust from the measurement uh, properties perspective, statistical perspectives. And so that will translate into more efficient analysis and ultimately more efficient uh, research and studies that we design with this. Uh, so um, um, that that's a big kind of uh, excitement and opportunity. But at the same time, I have to admit that there are challenges with this, right? Because as we are starting to 
study sleep outside of the narrow sleep domain, there are so many more people like me uh, that had to learn about sleep, right? And had to start understanding what it is that we will be uh, trying to measure and uh, how. And uh, for this, I think that the resources that uh, this team in this project produce are really invaluable and uh, would have saved me uh, a lot of time and effort. Uh, and really, this is like starting uh, already with the uh, resources such as uh, the template text for standardized rationale uh, for the use of uh, core uh, digital measures of sleep and the comprehensive checklist and report forms. I think that both of these resources really provide a good framework for identifying and documenting uh, like what pieces are needed for planning of your research and also uh, uh, evaluating the evidence that is out there, validation evidence, first of all, like for two very important aspects. Uh, one, why a specific measure of sleep would be relevant in your context, and second, uh, how exactly it will be measured and uh, whether the technologies uh, that you're selecting are appropriate for this. Uh, and also the definitions and the sleep measurement system that was produced that resource is absolutely fantastic. Uh, again, as a person who plans the analysis of uh, data, then analyzes and interprets data, we really need to understand uh, the definitions and all the nitty gritty details in order to do that planning and interpretation uh, properly. Uh, and uh, the, these resources are just wonderful in providing all the necessary details and uh, educating people on what they need to pay attention to uh, and uh, really how it works and understand really uh, what is being provided as a result of these measurements and how we can then process that for our research purposes. That's amazing, Bodana. I, I wish we had time to talk to both of you further. I have so many more questions I could ask. I'll just say, to me, I hear you speaking and think, okay, if you are a researcher, a clinician in, who um, is interested in human health behavior and you're not studying sleep, you should be. And we have the tools here now to help you do that well. I want to thank both of you for your comments and your support across this project. You've been both amazing. And I'll turn it back to Piper. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll just get my slide back up and progress us on, hopefully, one moment, everybody. Great. Thank you so much for that. We're going to start wrapping up with our final fire side chat. And this is the real world impact of digital sleep measurement. For this, I'd like to invite Farah, Farah Hassan um, to turn camera on and I'll stop sharing screen and we can start having um, a, a chat on this topic. So, hi, there you are. I can see you now. That's great. <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining me. I'm just going to say um, that, well, we're so happy to have you here. I wanted to introduce you a little bit so to, to, to tell people that like, you're, you're really kind of on the intersection <clears throat> of all of these things, right? Um, sleep, both research and patient point of view, digital health technology. Your master's thesis was about using virtual reality to learn human anatomy. Um, you've, uh, you, you're, you're, you're interested in developing VR simulations to like help people understand what it's like to experience a sleep disorder. And you're, you're, you're a member of the expert advisory board at, at Project Sleep and you're a patient speaker with Ri the Rising Voices program at Project Sleep. So it's like all of this is confluencing. And, and just before I like ask some other questions to you and get, get you to discuss your experience, I want to say like, how grateful we are for your input throughout this project. Like right at the beginning, you gave us thoughts on your experience and all of us were able to like really draw on that and say, oh, okay, this these things are important for so many people and that's been invaluable. And now towards the end of the project, talking through what's what's gone on, it's it's been great. So on yeah. that, I thought I'd invite you to um, talk a bit about like your experience and maybe your patient, patient experience. You can talk a bit about um, the condition and like how um, like polysomnography and uh, maybe talk a bit about something called, you may want to tell people about this, the maintaining latency sleep. You can, you can tell them about the acronym. But, yeah, um, absolutely. Um, I do want to, you know, start off by addressing what you said and, you know, thanking you, you know, for including me. Um, you know, I do this advocacy work and, 
you know, the fact that we're creating space for, you know, like so many of the speakers mentioned actually like what it feels like and how this all plays out in the real world is so important. So thank you. Um, yeah, so, you know, to, to speak a little bit to my experience of, you know, being in the sleep lab, I've done a number of sleep studies and, um, you know, we talked a lot about, you know, polysomnography. Um, for me personally, I've done the overnight studies. I have also done um, the MSLT, so the multiple sleep latency test, um, you know, which to some people sounds wonderful. It's like, oh, you get to nap all day. Um, in reality, what it is, is kind of every two hours you're asked to take a nap and then, you know, we're measuring all these metrics and seeing how long it takes you to fall asleep and, you know, do you go into REM and things like that. Um, you know, for me, it's it's a question of looking at, you know, idiopathic hypersomnia or narcolepsy in my case, um, you know, but it a lot of people touched on, you know, this unnatural experience. And, you know, as a researcher, we talk about this all the time where it's like the lab is a lab. It is a simulation environment. None of it is real. We do our best, obviously, to recreate real world experiences. But um, there's always this gap. And, you know, I think in the same way, you know, getting strapped up to as many electrodes as there are and having stuff around your chest and your legs and on your face. And I mean, by the time you're done, it's like being in a straight jacket and then someone, you know, very politely says, have a good night. And it's like, no, <laughs> um, it's just so different from what it feels like to, you know, to have a regular night's sleep or even, you know, taking naps during the day. Exactly. And that's, I think the important, the important part of like getting the research, like, I, I, I think we're always going to have polysomnography and rightly so, but we need to be able to complement that with, you know, how, how are you actually sleeping in, in the environment that you, that you just described? And I think that we've talked a bit before about the, the value uh, on top of it, not just, not just, oh, it's, it's a normal, more normal night's sleep for me if you measure it in the real world, but like the, the added value that, that we have when we go into the real world. And I know that um, you, you've given me a quote before, um, which is, they just didn't catch this. Um, and it just took so long. So John, maybe talk a little bit about that and the value it'll ha it will have going forward for people in uh, looking for understanding their sleep. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think the thing that's been most exciting about this project for me is just the knowledge translation piece. And, you know, people have talked about it today, but, you know, on the research end, we're doing the research. We understand, you know, hopefully we understand, you know, the stats that we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, but helping, you know, the broader public and people in different sectors to really understand why it matters is is so key. And, you know, for me, like this idea of they didn't catch it, you know, looking back, I started showing symptoms around the age of five. I didn't get any kind of diagnosis until I was 21. And even since that point in time, which was, I think, 2016, um, you know, there it's been a working diagnosis and going back and trying to piece things together. Um, you know, I remember this particular event, you know, I was at the sleep lab with my mom and, you know, we were waiting to be called in and we saw this adorable little boy, he was wearing Batman pajamas, you know, and he was beside his mom and, you know, waiting for his sleep study. And, you know, I remember my mom commenting on the fact that, oh, you know, I don't usually see, you know, kids in the sleep lab. And to her, it was, you know, kind of just like an observation. And to me, I remember getting a little choked up. Uh, just knowing that, you know, like this little boy actually had people in his orbit who could catch these things, who were aware enough and had enough knowledge to, you know, they didn't necessarily know what was happening, but they knew that something was up, right? And putting these metrics on people's radar, um, you know, it makes a world of difference, right? Going through 16 years without a diagnosis, um, it, it, it's profound. Yeah. And and that's it that I think it's that distinction between someone who is like a little boy who's getting there, you know, at least starting the path early. And, and that's one. There are plenty underneath that, that aren't getting that yet. And then the contrast of that and the, the 16 years you spent, like, uh, are we going to finish now? But like, I think if you could just say like a bit of the impact that had, because it we can see what's going to happen now we're, doing, we're measuring the community and, and, and the impact we're going to have to help like avoid that in future in, in, in a lot of people. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, and I, I think for, you know, some disorders in particular, you know, some of the things that, you know, affect me, like, those, those critical years, like going through being a teenager, and, you know, going through school, all of your social interactions, I mean, the, you know, getting through school, like, I'm, I'm a teacher's pet, and, you know, try hard and all of that. And so you learn how to manage and, you know, and pull through, but so much of it becomes internalized where it's like, why didn't I work harder? How come I didn't plan better? You know, like, why didn't I go to bed on time? And it's not until way later, at least in my case, that you realize, oh, okay, it wasn't all just a me problem. It wasn't, you know, lack of effort or, you know, whatever it is. And, you know, academically speaking, you know, I'm very grateful. I just defended my master's thesis, but it's been a journey. And, you know, all of those things along the way, you know, so much of it gets internalized. Um, and, you know, once I understood that there was something going on and, you know, understood, okay, I can reach out for support and, you know, reach out to accessibility services, like things that just would never have been on my radar, right? Um, so, you know, it it affects every, you know, piece of life, I think. Yeah. And that's what we're really hoping to see from this is making sure that there's more just general understanding. We heard from the National Sleep Foundation um, earlier at Thrunton, like the stuff we've done here goes hand in hand with things like that so that more people can understand more about their sleep. They can go to clinicians that we hope now we've given the start of some resources that they can spend the time talking about it and they can help people avoid that internalization that, that you had thinking, oh, this is on me when it, it's not, it's something that can have help and should have help and people be able to access that help alongside, you know, more realistic research to, to fund, to, to be fueled and, and to, to really help um, uh, give people options in their life. I think. Yeah. I was going to say just the fact that so much of it is treatable um, yeah. until you know that there's something to treat. Right. Exactly. Well, I'd like to thank you again for this, uh, for the short chat and, and your experiences you shared with us. So thank you so much. Thank you. Right. I'll pull up the screen one last time. You think I'd be getting a bit faster at this now, wouldn't you? But um, I think uh, trying to control things from a Mac is always interesting. I am sharing screen. So that brings us to the end um, of our things. I just wanted to thank everyone, our project team, our, our, our folks internally at uh, Digital Medicine Society, our guest speakers today, and um, just everyone who's been part of this. And I want to thank you as well for attending and going forward, like using these and making sure that we make be the change we want to see in the world. Make sure we use this to to improve lives, improve health, and and create a, a health a healthier society through the pillar of health that is sleep. I would like to take this opportunity to say we've got more fantastic work coming up. We're going to be doing the building a business case for digital endpoints um, to make sure that leaders from across the field can come together to develop these ideas of, of how do we build the business case to support the development, adoption and scale of digital endpoints. It includes the stuff we talk about today. How do you get this into the things we want to do? And we also always have time um, webinars and these are cutting edge up to the minute, um, talking about the science and, and how um, the world is changing for the better because of digital health technology. So please do keep an eye on those and join us. On that, I would like to thank everybody for joining us and um, hope to see our resources infiltrating and helping you with your work soon. Um, thank you very much and goodbye.